when we study the scriptures, we find all through the scriptures there is this principle of teaching. And it's teaching through metaphor or through similitude, through types and lessons. And as we heard this morning that the Israel of old is the biggest play, if you like, of redemption. How many years has it taken to, for God to show us these things? Even when Jesus spoke, he spoke in parables. He wanted to use metaphors, analogies, and allegories, and all these ways of teaching so that we could pick it up, not through f- uh, long, big words, but by simple lessons that it didn't matter which country you came from. It didn't matter what background you came from. These parables everyone could relate to. And this is how the Bible teaches through metaphor and through symbolism and through these parables. And that is exactly what the history of the Israel of old has been. And so that which has been shall be, and that which was done shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. Nothing's new. It's already been done. You think you have a good idea, it's already been thought of. It's already been done. You're not original. And so the history of Israel can be applied in different ways. Same with the parables of Jesus Christ. You can apply them to, as this picture here illustrates, from the time that sin entered into the world, the bondage of sin, to the time that Christ shall come and set the people free from the physical bondage of this earth. And then we can also parallel, draw a parallel with the Christian era also as being this type. We can also draw the parallel of your personal life. That when you were born to when you were sanctified and glorified, the Israel journey experiences the path of a Christian life. And it's this personal experience that I would like to spend the time that I have to, to share with you on. I'd like to challenge you on a personal basis that, the, that as we go through these, you can apply them directly to your personal walk. And so this is how I would like to share these messages. In the time of Christ... Jesus was wondering, how shall I compare this generation? And you know what he says? He says, it's like in the marketplace when the pipers piped, but they did not dance. And the mourners mourned, but they did not lament. And that is what people are like today. That you can pipe God's word, the joys of God's word, and people still don't respond. And you can bring out the hideousness of sin and the woes of sin and people still don't respond. And so the challenge is that when we go through these on a personal basis, as we pipe the pipe of glory of what Jesus has done, and when we have mourned the the woes of sin, that you will both dance and lament. The Word of God calls for a reaction. When God's Word is presented there needs to be something that is done in the other person. But in the generation of Jesus and today, people hear it and do nothing about it. So this is the challenge, that you'll hear and that you'll graciously lament. Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Geographically, our Lord was crucified at Jerusalem. Here, the Bible is drawing a spiritual comparison that Jesus was killed in Egypt. And we're going to compare this scripture with John chapter 15, verse 18 to 20. 
If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I have said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. So what persecuted Jesus Christ? What does it say? The world has persecuted me. So here is the comparison that Egypt represents the world. And I want to set this right at the beginning. Egypt represents this sinful world and the people in it. So I'd like to just go through the narrative of the story, of the history. Israel came into bondage. And Israel came into bondage in an unusual way. They weren't captured as a nation and brought into Egypt. They weren't besieged and, and killed and then their spoil was brought into Egypt. They came into Egypt from their own accord. The fathers of the children of Israel came into Egypt on their own accord. And they were there and they were not in bondage. And we will read in Exodus chapter 1 the narrative of this. Exodus chapter 1 and we're reading in verse 7 to 9. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto this people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. So there was an increase, increasing of, and, and the prosperity of Israel and Egypt. And in this prosperity, the king thought, oh, this, these people can destroy us. And so they dealt wisely, they cunningly, to bring these people into bondage. And we'll read in verse 11 as well now. And therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. They built for Pharaoh treasure cities and these cities there, I have trouble pronouncing them. You can read them for yourself. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with Riga, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their services wherein they made them serve was with Riga. So they put them to... They put Israel to task. And these poor Israelites, they worked in the brick kilns and they worked in the fields and they worked building the cities and the glories of Egypt that we see today, no doubt, was probably built by the Israelites, these hard workers. They were building up Egypt. Pharaoh dealt really subtly with them and so they would build up his own kingdom. And then, even with their work, they still multiplied. And so they come up with another plan that we're going to destroy their firstborn. We're going to take their firstborn and put them in the river, as it says in verse 22 of the same chapter. Exodus 1 verse 22, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall stay alive. So they wanted to destroy the strength of the family, which is the firstborn the firstborn male. And so this was the plan of Egypt, and these will, we will enlarge in the later study, but we're just going through the narrative here. And they destroyed their firstborn. Now, in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23, 
Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23, we read, And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered their covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. These poor Israelites, they had lost their children. They were working day, long days with, with the whiplashes across their back. They had to build in the, in the heat of Egypt. And after the process of time, there came this cry unto God. And do you know what God did? Do you know what God did to these people? He heard their cry and he sent them a man. He sent them a man. And this man, his name is Moses. And Moses came, and in Exodus chapter 5 we can read, as we continue, and after Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and with a sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, do ye Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get ye unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the, the same day the taskmasters of the people and the officers, saying, you shall no more give them straw to make bricks, as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tail of the bricks, which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye, sh ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore the cry, therefore they, they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice unto our God. So Moses came in and made things worse. You know, the people went up to Moses and told him to go away. Because they had to make bricks, they had to make perhaps a thousand bricks in a day. And now they weren't allowed to have the straw. They had to go out to the field, pick the straw, come back and still make a thousand in a day. And if they didn't do it, they will get the lashes. And then they would get beaten. And the next day they're beaten and they're sore. And they've still got to go out and get the stubble. And still make a thousand. And this effect really made their bondage hard. But the narrative goes on. And Moses comes to free the people through the voice of God. And we know the ten plagues. But before we consider the ten plagues, if Israel worked well, do you think their taskmasters would have said, oh, well, you've worked well today, you can go away for a three-day holiday now? Do you think if they thought, well, okay, if we really try and make a thousand, maybe if we make 1,100 bricks, they'll say, well done. And if we do that over a period of time, we would have made extra bricks so that we could have three days off and come back and the amount of bricks would still be the same. But no, these taskmasters, didn't matter how many they made, whatever their top limit was, they had to keep it up. And if they did better, then they had to keep it up again. And so their working, their works would not bring them out of Egypt. Didn't matter how well they labored, it would not release them from Egypt. And then we have the story of the serpent, the, the Aaron's rod that turned into a serpent. But the question is, did that save them? Did that release them from their bondage? And then after the serpent, there was the frogs. Does the frog of Egypt save you from your bondage? Far from it. The lice. 
Did the lice save them from their bondage? Did the flies save them from their bondage? Did the hailstones save them from their bondage? Did the angel of death save them from their bondage? And this is what we have to speak today. The Passover. The Passover feast. Because here today, the allegory says that only the blood of the Lamb will bring you out of Egypt. These pestilences destroyed Egypt, but it didn't release the Israelites. And so let us have a look at this service of the Passover. It is only the blood of the Lamb that releases from bondage. And so in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1 onwards, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye to all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take unto every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto him take house, take it according to the number of the souls, every man according to his eating shall make you count for the lamb. For your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two sides of the posts and the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. And so on. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins gird, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. It is the Lord's Passover. The angel was coming to destroy the firstborn of the Egyptians. Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. The Egyptians had slain the firstborn of the Israelites and now God had come to recompense the punishment upon upon Egypt. And Israel also could have been punished again, but they needed this Passover feast. Take a lamb, it says. Let us think about this. Take a lamb. Oh, poor sheep. What have we done to this sheepish race since our earth began? You think about all the animals. These sheep, we have killed them for our food. We have dragged their skin off their back. We have given them such a hard time, these poor sheep. These sheep, they're harmless. They're innocent. And we humans have really given this sheepish race a really hard time. In fact, the first animal to die, what was it? A lamb. And today, a lamb still dying? Yeah, because we eat them. Well, we don't. The world does. More than ever before. These sheep. There are many sheep in New Zealand. And New Zealand consume the most sheep in the whole world. And so, it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. And let us turn there. Speaking of Christ, for such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, 
undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Holy and harmless. This was the animal that was to be taken. This harmless animal that couldn't hurt anybody was to be taken. Take a lamb. And this lamb is to be have its blood drained for our salvation. It is to be its flesh is to be eaten for our life. And it is still for our clothing. It has to have its skin dragged off its back. This is a fitting picture of Jesus Christ who has bled for us, who has had every discomfort you can think of for your clothing, for your sustenance, for your salvation, for your redemption from Egypt. And a lamb conveys to a human, proud human, a lamb conveys the person of a suffering, silent, patient, harmless Messiah. Isaiah 53, you turn there to read Isaiah chapter 53, the description of Jesus Christ. And reading in verse 4 to 7, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. This is Jesus Christ, a lamb. Poor sheep. They have their own wool. They're warm, but no. They must lose it for the sake of humans. They have their own life. They have the grass to eat. They have their food, but no. Their life must be taken for humans. And so it is that Jesus Christ spilt his blood for humans. A lamb. Take a lamb of the first year. The time when the lamb is the strongest is in its first year. When it is one year old, that lamb is very strong. And so Jesus Christ offered himself at the age of 33. At an age where he was strong. He didn't offer himself at the end of his life when he had already enjoyed his life and said, okay, now I'll die for all the people. I'm going to die anyway. It was in his prime, his strength. He had lots of um, things that could happen for him. And it was at that time, at his strength, he died. And you may recall the record when Jesus died and he died before the, the other two died. And what did Pilate say? Pilate was heard that Jesus already died and he marveled. Wow, he's, di- he's dead already? Although Jesus Christ was marred more than any man, he was a strong man. And so Israel were to take a lamb of the first year. But in here, in Exodus chapter 12, it says that they were to take it on the tenth day into their home, they are to separate it from where it was and bring it into their home until the 14th day. How many days is that? Five days. Five days. The 10th, the 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th. Five days before, or including that day, five days they were to take the lamb and bring it into their home. 
And there is three lessons we can gain from this. Three lessons. Because when you bring the lamb into your home, first, you have to make sure it is without blemish. So you have, you have it in your home. You are looking at it constantly. And you can determine, is this lamb without blemish? Does it have any problems? Because sometimes the first look may be deceiving. The first glance, well, that's a fairly good sheep, a lamb, and you bring it in, or perhaps it's not. They had to examine this lamb. And as they had it in their home, they could keep looking at it and keep studying it and keep making sure that this lamb was the one. The second lesson we can learn is that this lamb in their home would have been bleating. It's been pulled out from the rest. So it may be bleating. And while you're in your home, you have this bleating lamb going on. And you'd be thinking, mm, the Passover's coming. This lamb keeps reminding me. You cannot forget the lamb is in your home because it's bleating. Maybe you put the lamb in the corner and shut the door, and if it didn't bleat, you might forget about it. Five days later, you'd think, was I meant to be doing something? But this lamb would bleat. Wouldn't let you forget. All day long, all night long, this lamb, little lamb, bleating. So you would know for that five days, day and night, what was happening. It would bring into your remembrance the Passover. Five days. And second, thirdly, the third illustration we could bring is that you can befriend this lamb. Can you imagine the firstborn of the family, how much he would have liked this lamb? Because this lamb's blood was going to save the firstborn in the house, correct? So this firstborn, the son, would have really loved this lamb. So he would have come in and this lamb would have been that boy's best friend. Because in five days, that boy could be dead. And so that boy would have went there and he would have fed the lamb. He would have looked after that lamb. He would have befriended that lamb. He would have patted the lamb and really, really enjoyed it. And I believe also the mother would have enjoyed it because there's not, nothing like the love of, of their mother to their firstborn son. And so their mother would have loved this lamb because this lamb was going to save her son. But also the love of the father. What love does a father have to their firstborn son also? And so the father would have loved this lamb and befriended the lamb. In fact, the whole family would have loved this lamb because this lamb was their salvation. This lamb was their redemption from Israel. And so this friendship is to take place over the five days. And I can imagine in the time there that they would have gone and got their lamb and then they would have went to the neighbours, oh, can I see your lamb? And they wanted to look at each other's lambs because this, these lambs were so precious. These lambs were their life. And they would have really, oh, can I look at your lamb? Well, if, I, if I can look at yours, you can look at mine. And so there would have been this real interrelationship with this lamb. You can imagine how many houses there would have been. And this lamb, would have been the center of attention, the center of attraction. And when they brought it into the house, there would have been some shouts of joy and hooray because this lamb, this Passover lamb was coming so they could have redemption. Redemptions didn't come from the frogs of Egypt. Redemptions didn't come from the flies. It came from this lamb. And so this bleating lamb their little friend who they inspected that was without blemish. Beautiful lamb. Five days before the Passover. Can you turn with me to John chapter 12? John chapter 12, and we're going to read in verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. We know the story. How many days? Six. Okay. 
Now verse 12. On the next day, what day was that? If the day before was the sixth day, on the next day, what day was that? The fifth day. What happened? It says in verse 12, On the next day much people were come to the feast, and they heard that Jesus was come to Jerusalem. Was coming to Jerusalem. They took branches and palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. What happened five days before the, before the Passover? Jesus the Lamb was brought into the house. And there was a hooray. Wow, the Lamb. We have brought it in to Jerusalem. Five days before the Passover. And there they received him like I believe they would have received that lamb in Egypt with joy. And in verse 19, the Pharisees were looking on from the temple wall, I believe. And the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. Wow. Wow. The world has gone after Jesus, this lamb. And so, this five days before this lamb, there is these lessons we can learn. That the bleating of the lamb brought into remembrance the things that were for their salvation. This lamb that was in their home, bleeding day and night, they would have remembered Wow, the Passover, we're coming out of Egypt, and everything that pertained to their salvation. The Bible talks more of the five days, these last five days of, of, of Jesus' life, than any other period of his time. Because we are reading in the 12th chapter of John. How many chapters are in the book of John? 20? And we're in the last five days of his life in chapter 12. And you have chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and they're all the five days. This, this is recorded so we can hear the bleating of Jesus. What Jesus wants to put into remembrance. What did he do during these three days? He cleansed the temple. Did he not? This lamb wasn't a dirty lamb. It was a clean lamb. And it came to clean the house of God. He healed at the temple. It was in these five days that he cursed the fig tree that had no fruit. And so it would have been with that lamb bleating. If though people never had a heart for this lamb, really... It was a rebuke to them. He cursed the fig tree. He also told the parable of the two sons. The two sons. He also told the parable of the king's son and the wedding. Being ready. Jesus also told about the great commandment of love. This is what the sheep is bleating about. This is what Jesus is saying in the last five days before the Passover. What they were to inspect they were to look at this lamb and study this lamb to make sure it was the one, the lamb of God. He also separated the sheep from the goats in the last five days. The goats on his left hand, on his, uh, on his left hand and the sheep on his right. It was in these five days that he spoke about the ten virgins that were sleepy. The Passover wasn't a time for sleeping. It was the night that they could stay up. But we, we hear the bleating of Jesus saying, no, some of them were sleeping. They were to go out with haste, have their shoes on, and have their lamps trimmed and burning, but some of them fell asleep. And it is in this last five days that Jesus rebukes the Pharisees, rebukes the leaven, to take the leaven out of the bread. Because this feast was be, to be taken with unleavened bread. And so it was that Jesus rebuked the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. 
This is the bleeding of Jesus during those five days. And I would like to also bring out the, the lesson of examining. And for time's sake, I will just um, explain what is written. But do you know how many people went to Jesus during these last five days? Did the Pharisees go and ask, question Jesus during these five days? They certainly did. What about the Herodians when they came to him about paying tax? It was in these last five days that the Herodians came to Jesus to, to question him and say, well, how do you stand on the tax matter? What sort of answer did Jesus give? Was it a right answer? Amen, it was. They couldn't answer him back. It was in these five days that the lawyer came to Jesus. The lawyer came to Jesus and asked, which is the greatest commandment? And did Jesus answer the lawyer correctly? Oh, yes. The Sadducees came to ask Jesus about the resurrection of the, of the dead. And did Jesus answer the Sadducees correct? He did. They could not answer him. And it was in these five days that the Greeks came from afar and said, we would see Jesus. The Greeks came and said, we would see Jesus. We want to see the lamb too. We want, we've heard about this lamb and we want to come and look at it. And Rome, the ruling force of this world, examined this lamb and said, I find no fault with him. The officers said, never a man spake like this man. Jesus was examined by the common people. Jesus was examined by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the lawyers, the Greeks and the Romans and it, there was no fault with him. A lamb without blemish. Jesus is the only lamb the only one that has been examined by the whole world and they cannot find a fault with him. All this happened in these five days. And so, the third lesson was that we would befriend the Lamb. But unfortunately, not all of them befriended the lamb. Because if, it's, if this lamb is not your friend, what is the life of the lamb? It is just as all the others in the fold. But this lamb is to come into your home, into your heart, and be your friend. And to be the center of your life. Do you ever look at the cross of Jesus Christ and think, yes... He died for everybody. Yes, everyone knows that Jesus died. If, if that's all you look at it, then he's not your friend. If your friend was hanging on the cross, you would speak much differently. If you befriended this lamb and he became the center of your life and then he was to be killed at your own hand, Oh, what a time. The firstborn son, he would have loved this lamb and he would have went with his father to see his father slay it. Oh, those firstborn sons would have wept because this lamb was their life. They would have wept. And so, it is easy for us to say, yes, Jesus is without spot. He is 
a lamb without blemish. There is no fault in him. Pilate said it. The Pharisees said it. No man spake like this man. The lawyers couldn't get him. The Sadducees couldn't get him. The Herodians couldn't get him because he was without blemish. But they did not befriend the lamb. They heard his bleating. They knew he was without spot and it was the Passover, but they didn't befriend this lamb. And this is the point, brothers and sisters. This is the challenge to befriend Jesus Christ. If you find the cross of Christ a little dry, make him your friend, then look at the cross. Make him your best friend and then look at the cross. How do I befriend him? Do you know what the Bible says about having friends? He that would have friends must show himself friendly. Be a friend to Jesus. He has befriended you. You must now befriend him. Because friendship is always a two-way street. He said that I was killed in the house of my friends. Did he not say that? He said that. But most of the people in the house didn't even befriend him back. So brothers and sisters, if you want to befriend Jesus Christ, be friendly to him. Talk with him. Pray to him. Study his life. Get to know him. Even if you don't see him on the cross yet, give it five days and then look at the cross. And it will change your life. If the cross doesn't change your life, you haven't realized his friendship to you. It says that he that loveth the pure heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. This is Proverbs chapter 22, verse 11. He that loveth the pure heart, for the grace of his lips shall befriend the king. Do you want a pure heart, brothers and sisters? Do you want to be pure through and through, like this lamb that was without spot? Do you want to be washed in, this, in the blood of the lamb, to be white? Then if that is your desire, you are on the road to a friendship with Jesus Christ, because the king will make you your friend. And doesn't everyone want to be the, king of the, the friend of the king? Everyone wants to be the friend of the king. And so Jesus is offering his friendship. And there is a number of lessons we can learn for friendship. And there is no closer friendship than husband and wife, really. The true husband and wife. And so his church is to be truly his friend. Read with me in Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 16. His mouth is so sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. He is my beloved and he is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is the declaration of the bride of the king, the lamb's wife. Oh, that husbands and wives would be friends. Then there would be love. You know, the greatest love stories in the Bible, the greatest love stories is between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. Jonathan and David and Ruth and Naomi. Oh, they loved each other. Because of the friendship. This is not a kinky sort of love. This is friendship love that the Bible speaks about. The greatest love stories ever recorded in the Bible. And so the friendship of Jesus Christ is to be the preeminence of your life. You might say, well, why would the king want to come to be friends with the, the poor people of the town, the, the dirty people? Well, the Bible declares in the 11th of Matthew that Jesus is a friend of publicans and sinners. If you were a sinner, then you were Jesus' friend. If you were self-righteous, perhaps not, he is your friend. And the Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. He that is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do you want to befriend Jesus Christ? Get rid of the world. He'll be your friend. 
because the world, Egypt, killed him. He died in Egypt. Don't love Egypt. Love the lamb because he'll take you out. And there are some points of his death. The Bible, they had to shed his blood. They had to roast him, this lamb. And they weren't allowed to break any bones. And if you think about that. Now this roasting talks about the length of death. When, it, when you roast something, it takes some time. So the death is a prolonged death. It sheds blood and no bones are broken. How many types of deaths do you think can actually occur that? If you hung someone, it can be a little bit lengthy. But did they bleed? No, they don't bleed. If you spear somebody, they may bleed, they may not break a bone, but they will die very quickly. If you stone somebody, they may take some time to die, they may bleed, but they'll break some bones. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ answered every point of Jesus' death. It took a long time. It shed his blood and it didn't break his bones. We can read in John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And there are some lessons to learn and we will briefly touch them because time is so runs away on us. John chapter 19. And we will read here of the death of Christ. John 19 and reading in verse 32 through 33 and 36. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already. They broke not his legs. In verse 36. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. So the breaking of the bone or or the lack of breaking of the bone was to fulfill the scriptures. And we have these three aspects of the death of Jesus. These three aspects makes Jesus palatable for you and me. Because you remember us reading, it says that you should roast this lamb and you should not do it with water and, and and not raw, but you should do it and then eat it. The way Jesus dies makes him palatable for you and me. In three ways it makes him palatable. In three ways. One, that Jesus Christ gives his blood, his life, the life is in the blood, for our sins. The blood must be shed when he dies. The second, the length of suffering makes him able to succor those who are also suffering. You know, when you go through the fire of affliction, be sure that the lamb also went through the fire of affliction. He can know how you feel. He didn't die instantly. He suffered. And he suffered not just on the cross, but he suffered being tempted, the scripture says. And so when you and I attempted, we have someone, a lamb, that knows how we feel. And that makes him palatable for us. And the third, that he fulfills scripture. That Jesus Christ fulfills the word of his Father in heaven. That Jesus Christ was obedient even to the death of the cross. That he asked the Father and he did Not his own will, but the will of his Father. And this makes Jesus palatable for us. Only the crucifixion and the sufferings of Jesus' life can make himself palatable for us to consume. And so, we are to befriend Jesus. And we are to eat the flesh. And this is very... This is such a hard metaphor to get your head around. And the 70 disciples couldn't and they didn't walk with him anymore. 
when Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood and you'll have life in you. And the 70 disciples said, oh, that is a hard saying. And they turned and walked no more with him. But Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I'm giving you a metaphor. That's what I'm saying. I'm giving you, as I've always taught, in symbol. And so spiritually, we are to eat our friend. When people eat lambs, they have no connection with that lamb. It's come from the abattoir. It's been wrapped up nicely in some glad wrap with a Woolworth sticker on it and put on the, on the thing, and they can eat it, no worries. But if every person had to slay a lamb, their friend, their little pet lamb that the children grew up with and that they loved, and then eat it, oh, what a hard thing to do. But I would like to propose to you for something, that if you do not spiritually eat your friend Jesus Christ. Do you know what will happen to you in the last day? Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 8 and 9. And here, and I will make this city, talking of Jerusalem, desolate and, and hissing. Everyone that passes thereby shall be astonished and hiss because of, of all the plagues thereof. And I will cause thee to eat the flesh of thy sons and the flesh of thy daughters and eat the flesh of every one, the flesh of his friend in the siege and the straightness wherewith the enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. Wow, what happened to Jerusalem? Those that crucified Jesus Christ who had the Passover but never ate the Paschal Lamb, never ate Jesus Christ, and when Jerusalem was destroyed, which is a type of when this earth is destroyed, they had to eat their friends literally. Try that. Think about that. Because this actually happened. This was not, this is a, our, from our learning, but this really happened. Because what God says is not playing around. It really happens that they had to eat the flesh of their friends. Think of your friend. Think of you, your, your best friend that you have here. Think of them. And what will you have for lunch? Really? And Jesus is saying, eat me. Oh, I'd rather eat the Paschal Lamb. This is what will take place in the end in the last day, and that has happened in famines, destitute people, and they have eaten their sons. In fact, my wife's mother was in the war in Cambodia and fled from Cambodia to Thailand, and on the way she saw a mother eating their child with her own eyes. This happens, brothers and sisters, around the world because they haven't eaten the Paschal Lamb. Cambodia hasn't taken hold of Jesus Christ as a nation as a large people, they have suffered. And don't think any different to you and I if we don't take hold of our friend, Jesus Christ. The blood must be applied upon the posts. Which post? The left, the right, and the upper. You know, the blood was never to be put on the threshold of the house. And neither are we ever to trample under, the, under our feet the blood of Jesus Christ. It is to be over us, not under us. The, the, this on, the, on this door post and on this door post and above them was to prevent the plague to come in to destroy them. And so it says in Psalms 91, it says, Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, for the, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. For a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right side, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. There shall be no evil before thee. The plague shall not 
come nigh unto thy dwelling. That Jesus Christ is to be at your left hand and at your right hand. He's to be on either side and the pestilence won't come near you. Don't look for the world to save you from the pestilence, to get all these injections and everything else you need to get, get through all these pestilences. If you have the blood of Jesus Christ, even if you lose your body on this earth, you have gained your body in the new earth. Jesus Christ, those that have the blood of Christ, are freed from this plague. He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. The blood is to be on top of you as well. You know when we go into the water, the water is all around you, left, right, above. And so we are to plunge through the blood of Jesus Christ to put your head under the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't just wash half of yourself in the blood of the Lamb. Wash your whole body in the blood of the Lamb. And so we are to eat the Lamb, to make friends of Jesus Christ, and to partake of His Word. And this is what we are doing now. Reading His Word, partaking of Jesus Christ, befriending Jesus Christ, and applying the blood of Jesus Christ for our sins. And all this is to be done with the bread. What type of bread? Unleavened bread. It says in the scriptures that, that we are to have it with sincerity and truth. Not with the leaven of hypocrisy, but with the unleaven of sincerity and truth. You are to take hold of Jesus sincerely. Not because your friends are taking hold of Jesus and you think, oh, I better do it too because everyone else around me is taking hold of Jesus. I should do it. With a sincerity of your heart, I'm going to take hold of Jesus. And not in a misunderstanding of Jesus in romance and in, in some um, um, emotional taking hold of Jesus. In truth, take hold of Jesus. Not in sentimentalism. Not in some flight of feeling, oh, the Lord has blessed me. You know, the woman in Song of Solomon, when she was in her room, she saw the hand of the Lord un trying to undo the lock to get in. And, her, and she was moved because of the hand of the Lord. How many Christians see the hand of God and go, oh, praise the Lord, I see the hand of the Lord. Yet he's actually still outside. His hand's just trying to get in. Because that woman who saw the hand of God and she was so touched emotionally, it says there, you can read it in Song of Solomon there, and, and she, her bowels moved and, and she was, oh, how beautiful this hand of, of, of my lover has trying to get into my room. And she laid there in basking in such a thought of romance. Oh, how nice. And she didn't even open the door to him. He left, she came out to look for him and then she got raped. Because she didn't do it in truth. It was in sentimentalism. Poor Christians. Poor people. If we would engage in Christ in just mere sentimentalism, in emotional feeling, we need to take hold of the lamb, the paschal lamb, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There's many sincere Christians, but they're not obeying the truth. There are many people obeying the truth, but they're not too sincere about it. And we are to connect both of them together, brothers and sisters. And so, I'd like to close with two scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Purge ye out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Salvation comes not from the frogs of Egypt, but from the Lamb of God. When it is applied in your life, you will escape Egypt. May the Lord bless us as we befriend Jesus Christ. We inspect Him and make Him the center of our home. And then He will be all to us. Amen.